Thanks, everybody, for welcoming me uh, this morning. It is weird for me to talk about badges. I have not talked about badges very much for the last three or four years. But as Don said, it, it's something that I was lucky enough uh, to be there at the beginning of. And so I want to, as all of you take this set of ideas around badges and, and educational disruption into the future, share a little bit about the original vision and about the history in the hopes that you can continue to carry some of that vision forward, because it's still something I do believe in very deeply. And you know, if I, I, I was thinking on the streetcar over here, I just actually live at the other end of King Street, so it's very nice of you to put the event right here. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking on the, the streetcar ride over, what was the vision? How would I describe it? And it was pretty simple and a little bit audacious, maybe even arrogant in the way that technologists and, and Silicon Valley can be arrogant in the sense that we thought, you know, maybe there's this one little open source technical innovation, this one little standard that if we kind of get it in the right hands can help to sort of break apart the ossification of the education system and make it more fluid, make it more democratic, and make it more equitable. And so, you know, it really was that bigger dream of a more democratic, equitable education system and the idea that, you know, we kind of is in the, the water in the internet world, at least, you know, back 10 years ago, things may be a little bit different now, uh, that the right bits of technology can open things up. And, you know, it sounds like no small task, right? When, and you know, because you're doing it, no small task, uh, to open up education and to, to make it something that is more democratic and equitable. But I often talk as, as a way to think about the, the ability to achieve this vision about email as a parallel potentially to badges. And if you think about you know, email, and I'll, I'll talk maybe a little bit later about some of the step-by-steps of, of how email evolved, but think about email, like what it's done. It has completely transformed the workplace. And yes, there's a lot of other internet technologies, but think back to your first email account email coming into the workplace. I mean, literally, when I started my career working in television uh, with people like Don, you know, email didn't exist in the workplace, and you had to go to the office. And now, you know, there's co-working spaces. There's places all around the world you can just kind of pop up and get your, your job done. It depends on your job, and a lot of you work in, in institutions where you do have to go to the place. But we've transformed the world of work with this, what was a very, very small standards-based invention that spread over a period of time. And not only the world of work, but of course our personal lives. I mean, think about writing letters to a, a loved one or a family member. Uh, there was a beauty in it, but our ability to stay connected to people in terms of like our emotional lives is just completely transformed. And so you think about this little piece of technology and a couple of standards that have chained work and our personal lives, I think mostly for the better. Of course, we have a lot of spam and we have a lot of abuse of email and we're driven nuts by email. But the social changes that flow from that standard are, are tremendous. And so to think that maybe we can use disruptively some technology like micro-credentials, like badges, to get what we want in terms of education being more valuable for all of us, I mean, that, that's the hope. And I think is a hope still worth pursuing. So I want to, to kind of talk about that hope and give you, arm you in, in that pursuit, go through a little bit of the history. And it is not the case, as Don said, it was, was not quite the case, uh, that open badges was invented on the back of a napkin in Barcelona, although Barcelona does come into the story momentarily. Uh, it was invented on a flip chart in California. And, and so the, really the genesis of it, and I think at, at each moment there's a, a lesson to be learned about the values or about how you pursue things like this. The, the original genesis of badges is almost 2009. It might have been early 2010, like January, but it's, it's about 10 years ago. And certainly in terms of the people who were planning and thinking about this and writing about it was, was very much 2009. But there was a key first meeting where we had Connie Al from MacArthur Foundation, who really was one of the big visionaries behind uh, all of the digital media learning stuff at MacArthur and badges and still works in it today. And Mike Hansen, who was at Mozilla Labs at the time, who'd come from Apple and is a real innovator in open identity and you know, all of the things around sort of how we build identity on the internet. 
And, you know, two things really stick in my mind from that meeting, other than, you know, the beautiful rolling hills of, uh, you know, of, of uh, California. One is that the kind of interdisciplinary sparks of having somebody who has spent their whole life focused on how you make digital identity something open and transformative and, you know, not do it the kind of way we've now gotten used to it in, in Facebook or not do it the ways that just kind of centralized logins. And, and frankly, Mike had also worked in education at Apple. So somebody who had that background as a, a deep engineering mind on identity innovation, who cared about education. And Connie has spent her whole career standing up for equity in education, trying to transform how education worked and break down the walls of, of schooling and, and, and universities, um, but also had a passion for technology. The two of them in the room for a day and a half really kind of painted the picture that I just described of what we might do. Um, and, and that was um, the starting point. And, and the, the value there beyond sort of, you know, having the right interdisciplinary minds together was from the beginning the idea that a standard was the critical piece. And so that's where the kind of Mike's identity mind came in, is if you actually want something like this to grow, even if it's going to twist and turn as badge as has, you need to be thinking about a standard uh, from the beginning. And so that was always the, the main conception, is something lightweight, something simple. And if you think about email, or I mean, I don't know how much people kind of think about email at a technical level anymore, really is SMTP in particular, which is the, the transport protocol for email. It's one little standard that took us from email being a concept that was on multiple networks to being something that still remains, even as the internet fragments, you know, something that works completely across the internet. And it, it's just that little SMTP standard. So that was the vision of Open Badges is, you know, something that works in a standard way. I can take my badges from eCampus Ontario to, you know, eCampus Italy or wherever I want to go in the future and that they, they interoperate. So that vision came from the very first meeting of it being a standard. The next key moment in the history of badges uh, was, in fact, in Barcelona, just a few months or, or maybe close to a year later. Um, we had our first Mozilla Festival uh, in Barcelona in October, I think, 2010. Uh, and it was, you know, what Mozilla Festival still is today, 10 years later. This is the 10th anniversary uh, of Mozilla Festival later this year. Um, it, you know, it's basically a hack fest for people who've got values about what technology can be to empower people. Uh, and we had people in a little room in Barcelona, like this was not a big, beautiful conference center overlooking the harbor of Toronto that is, may sound romantic, but it was a sweaty little room with stone arches and people trying to hack together something that would show what this standard might do. What is a badge? How are the badges going to talk to each other? And, you know, so we had a bunch of engineers, a bunch of educators, that same interdisciplinary approach um, who spent a week in a kind of little, you know, sweaty Airbnb hacking together a demo, and then brought it to the Mozilla Festival on the weekend and, and got their peers to, to kind of kick at it. Um, and we had um, you know, all kinds of people, people from the US Department of Education, um, Hal Plotkin, a bunch of other people who then became the champions of badges because they saw the demo. And so a couple of other values that, that are in that first piece that had happened in Barcelona is really that we're not only talking about open source, but we're talking or open standards. We're also talking about open source, and not just in the sense that the code is there. And yes, you can take code from somewhere else and bring it and set up eCampus Ontario or something else. But also in the sense that open source at its best is a barn raising. It's something where many people collaborate and build something up and can then later take it and adapt it and build it up more. And from the beginning, the idea is that collectively over time. Open Badges is about a kind of worldwide barn raising for this technology uh, that we want to have transform education. So those, those, I think, are the two critical genesis moments, uh, the open source and open standards moments that still, uh, in many ways, are at the heart of what Open Badges is and can be, although there are some tensions now. The, the second piece, and it's where I, you know, Don popped back into my life and, and many ways, and, and many other people who, who've been 
sort of pushing open badges over the last 10 years, is a, a few years on, 2011, we sort of announced the standard. 2012, we released some of the first real stuff that people use. The, the DML, Visual Media Learning, competition happens, which is the first big investment in people doing badge projects, in which you still see uh, the, the, you know, <clears throat> the anti you know the the kind of ripple effects today, including the technology you're using for for the eCampus Passport um, that is is being launched, um, and so that's the kind of period of, like trying to make the idea go. Um, and let me tell you, it was an exciting and deeply painful period. Uh, you know, trying to get a sort of big idea off the ground and actually build it and show it to people and get people to adopt it, um, you know, is tough. And I think most innovations that happen like this kind of happened by accident, including email. And trying to do it on purpose like may actually be stupid, uh, certainly hard. Um, and so that, that was a period of really trying to kind of prime the pump, let's say. And so MacArthur put millions of dollars both into the DML competition where people built prototypes on the open badge standard and into us building uh, a core set of badging technology, open source technology like badge backpacks and so on that we hoped people would ad adopt. Um, I would say from that period, and actually I should also say that the other place that MacArthur put money, and, and this is, anyways, it's a whole other conference talk on philanthropy and why it doesn't work, but um, the other place that uh, MacArthur put money in priming the pump was into the equity vision of it. And so also in that period was the Chicago Summer of Learning, a bunch of badging experiments in, in New York and, and other places really aimed at using badging to help people who, you know, kids who are not well connected and well served by the education system recognize their informal learning, recognize their kind of interest driven, passion driven learning, um, you know, as a part of what badges might do. So in that priming the pump period, I would say that the Mozilla part, I'm being recorded so I know this, um, really was probably the least successful uh, in that trying to go and build you know, the technology stock that everybody would run and, and adopt, people are using bits and pieces of that now. Um, but, you know, the idea that we kind of would be the driver of that in the way that we were with Firefox, it's hard to do on purpose. And, and again, it was you know, maybe where there was some, some hubris. It did really do what I, I think is um, one of the most important and valuable things, though, that you can do in open source, which is provide a reference implementation for the standard. So even if the Mozilla technology isn't the technology that grew at the scale of Firefox or isn't the most important technology today, it showed what was possible. And that reference implementation role, I think, was really our role. And when we realized that was our role, you know, we started to step out and look at other people taking roles. The piece that I think was most successful <clears throat> in that middle period was the DML competition in, in a sense, in that you know, we let or invited or, or MacArthur resourced uh, a, a wide variety of folks to try different things. And that is actually where open source works its best. Uh, you know, we encourage people to pick up the standard. We encourage it to use it in their own use cases. Uh, you know, encourage them even to use it commercially. And that really is kind of a different approach uh, than how philanthropy usually uh, approaches things. In that it's not just giving a grant for somebody to do a thing. It was giving a grant to somebody to do a thing with open source and open standards underneath it and letting that flow wherever it flowed. And even if you think about how government investment works, we're still actually not at that point where we take our public dollars or our philanthropic dollars and sort of insist that there is some kind of open source theory behind it, which to me is a, is a really big opportunity for public and, and philanthropic innovation. Because you see what happens is that it does give the, the idea for, uh, the chance for an idea to breathe and, and take, um, you know, go into motion over time. So that's kind of the middle period is, is the priming the pump piece where Mozilla and MacArthur play a pretty central role. Um, but around 2015 or so, um, both of us, for different reasons, realize it's time to, to step out and let others lead. And that, that actually is something I'm very proud of, because often we try to hold on to things and that kills them. 
Uh, and it was clear Mozilla's not an ed tech company. We're not a university. Uh, we might have thought for a hot second that maybe we should be either of those things, um, but it's not who we are. We're here as a champion of, of the free and open internet uh, and the internet being good for humanity. And badges is one example of that. And so we, we tried a number of things. Uh, as MacArthur pulled out of the funding space, we pulled out of the kind of building badge software space. We tried the Badge Alliance, which was a group of people working in the, the space. Um, didn't really work. Uh, we backed a number of people or encouraged a number of people who were um, doing sort of less formal things just to kind of keep the space connected. And so the whole Badge of the World project that Tim Riches at Digital Me, who went on to City and Guilds to, to champion badges there in the UK, uh, did was actually, in some ways, a, a nicer version of that kind of alliance to just let people see each other, see what was going on, see, see the momentum. And then eventually, and, and this was a, a kind of a, a hard thing to figure out too, we passed the standard off to IMS. Uh, and that was really the recognition for us that this is something that needs to be a standard owned in the education space that can be run with by the education space. And you know, you already had had a, a bunch of momentum by the time IMS took over the Open Badges standard. Um, you know, things like you know, Don had been working on this, Tim Rich has been working on this, people like IBM were working on this. You did have momentum, but I do believe you know, IMS coming in has helped unlock a lot more momentum in the space. Um, and so that's why I think of the current period we're, we're in, which is the education sector really metabolizing and innovating and figuring out where badges goes. Um, and, you know, as with, with any innovation, you know, like email or like badges, um, there's people with different values in the mix. There's people with different visions of what to use it for. I mean, it is an ecosystem. And um, so you see people who are really deep still in the open source vision of it. Uh, and you see people who are really still deep in the equity and democratization of education piece of it. And on the other end of the spectrum, you see people who are trying to build much more proprietary businesses, who have long standing historical proprietary businesses in, in ed tech, like Pearson, uh, who are trying to patent the technology, and who are trying to use the technology in the context of, of still quite ossified uh, or kind of controlling educational models. And you see everybody across the spectrum. And that is normal and I was, was going to say fine, but it's actually not only fine, it's good, is that tension in the system, as long as you still have the open technology underneath, as long as you still have people in pursuit of that original vision, to me is actually good. And it is how things unfold over time. Uh, and you know, are there questions of whether, say, on the patent front, uh, which I don't know if people are all in the, the loop on that, but there are some IS members who have patented aspects of badges that still the standard is there and is protected, arguably, but you know, those are kind of the tensions that emerge. Is that has happened in every internet technology. Uh, and so there are ways to work those out and to defend the open source nature of it. And you know, that's still stuff that we keep an eye on uh, and are, are there to, to be supportive on. But in, in any case, I think that tension, that spectrum of people that you know, tens of thousands of organizations around the world are now issuing badges is a positive thing and is, is the moment for you all uh, to decide where do you want to take this in your own work and, and collectively. And so, you know, I'll, I'll kind of wrap with some encouragement on that front and, and a thank you to all of you. Um, and, you know, the, the encouragement is to take the Open Badges technology, to take the vision of it and the idea of it and make it your own as you have and just do things. That whole spectrum doesn't need to be perfect. And that whole spectrum doesn't need to be how you envision it. What you can do and are doing, I, mean, I, I think what's emerging here with the, the backpack and passport in Ontario, uh, what you are doing is showing what's possible. And as you show what's possible, the values you build into it are the thing that both will affect the people you serve and inspire others to do things. And so it, it's really important because I think, especially you know, when you're thinking back to working with Connie and MacArthur, there's often this platonic ideal of what we're trying to do in innovation, and innovation doesn't work with platonic ideals. And so make ideal and make powerful and make laden with values the thing that you're building. Serve the students and the learners and the citizens that you care about, and that's actually is what is going to make it unlock. And I know 
in doing that, sometimes it feels like a long time. Like that's what David said to me just when we were chatting beginning. It's like, oh man, it's taking a long time to do this badge and stuff. And it is 10 years. I, I am 10 years older. Uh, actually, you know, I just turned 50 last week. And uh, so I was just turning 40 as we started this conversation. So that is a while. But it, if you think about email for a second, how many people here got, you know, their first email account um, in the 70s? Okay, nobody. How about the, the mid 80s? Okay, and how about in, the, in 1990? Okay, and then like 95. Like who had one by 95? Like everybody, right? And so, you know, that the first email is sent on the ARPANET in 1969. And so a couple of you, 10 years later, have got your hands up of having email. A few of you, 15 years later, have got your hand up uh, and you've got email. Certainly 20 years later, most of you have got email. I mean, I, I think really in terms of society broadly, uh, it's 25 years later. It's mostly the mid-90s. Um, and, and a couple of things about that. One is, you know, that's concurrent with the growth of the internet. So by 76, 75% of the ARPANET traffic is, is email. It's actually, in the internet community, it becomes a popular application very quickly. Um, but in society, it takes 20, 25 years with the growth of adjacent technologies to really grow. And so thinking about that you know, you're in a context and badges will grow. AI will affect badges. Identity um, technology will affect badges. All of these other kind, you know, privacy, other kind of privacy technologies, blockchain may affect badges. And so thinking about you know, what you're pursuing as in a context that grows over time, and even email, you know, it was 25 years for it to really start to become ubiquitous and transform society. We only start to get co-working spaces. In fact, Center for Social Innovation is one of the first co-working spaces in the world. Uh, and you only get that in, they just turned 10. Uh, and so you know, it takes a long time for the social impact of these things to, to grow uh, even further. And so keep that in mind as you, as you do this stuff. Um, and just also know that like, you are still 10 years in the pioneers, and you still have a chance to transform how education works here in Ontario uh, and in the world. And I am very grateful for you doing that work. So thanks very much. And I guess there's time for a couple questions. Um, so Mark uh, has agreed to take questions. Ask him anything. Uh, the only thing we say is that please uh, speak into the mics. We have a couple of mics in the audience. Um, so if anybody wants to put up their hand, will somebody run over with a mic? And there are prizes for the hardest question. Yeah. Do you still have the napkin? Uh, I, well, you know, if, and probably nobody in here has ever read my blog, but I don't, and I don't know, Don, if this is a joke for, for, uh, to that regard, but I am famous for having napkin illustrations in my blog posts. Uh, so there, are, I am sure blog, uh, posts that have badges, napkins on them. I do not have any physical napkins. There's a question over there. Um. They can now. Thank you. Thank you. Can you comment on the difference between the open badge, an organizational badge, say, given out by IBM or right. Cisco, and a university badge? Because I've been hearing these terms batted around. Right. Um, well, good question. Um, they can be the same thing, or they can be different things, and you know they, they exist on different metaphysical planes. Uh, in the and so you know an, an open badge, in the most strict sense of how I would define it, really is something that uses the open badge standard in terms of what is the metadata structure of that object. And I actually don't know how this part has evolved, but originally it also meant like how it was cryptographically signed. And so very specific um, definition. Um, of both what's in it and the provenance of it. And so both IBM and universities have open badges, so it's about the technical thing in the same way that both IBM and, and universities have email and they both talk the same standard. Um, I think 
universities and, and companies tend to be using them for different but related purposes. Uh, I mean, as much as I know about the, some of the IBM examples, it's about working with people to uh, document and credential skills that they're trying to get more of in the workforce. And so there has been historically a whole theory of companies who are having uh, a tough time getting the kind of talent they want, whether that's Starbucks or IBM, trying badges as a, as a way to like filter for high volumes of talent that they find hard to find and know whether the people are, are qualified. Whereas I think universities and, and colleges typically are, have, have been using them, but you guys are all more expert than me and, and Don will come up and talk. Uh, but the intent of it originally was, was typically about documenting things that are not normally the course credit. Uh, so a skill that I would, would learn sort of in the ether or in the process of, say, a degree, like a particular piece of software or a particular kind of sub-skill, or you know, things that are kind of more soft skills that I like being on the university student council or things like that. So those kinds of, of credentials, or for prior learning assessment has been, I, although I don't know how much progress has happened with that. Other questions? And let me know who you are and where you're from. Thank you. Hi, Debbie Johnson from Durham College. Um, could you comment, please, on what you think might happen in terms of blockchain as it relates to the open badging structure, and how do you think there might be a relationship between those? Um, usually in our meetings, but I didn't bring enough prizes with me. There's a prize of the first person who says blockchain. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I mean, we'll see. Uh, I mean, it's just another way to encrypt and store things, um, you know, the, and so we throw a blockchain around like it, either like it's a um, solution to something very, very different or is just kind of like a narrow technical piece. And I think it's, it's both and it just depends what you want to use it for. I think the, the, um, the thing that the blockchain has potential for, like I think if, if we were starting today to figure out open badges, we probably would have had the blockchain at the center of it. So maybe that's a, a helpful way to think about it. And some of the qualities of the blockchain that have been places that um, badges has struggled is like the ability for me to own it and move it around seamlessly across a little a, a bunch of environments, but to be able to understand provenance. And so the idea like I could give you a badge and you could pr prove that I had given it to you because it's cryptographically signed, but then you can walk around with it anywhere and share it and show it to somebody. Like that's kind of the, the thing we always had hoped that we could do with badges and has been a hard thing to solve in the kinds of technologies that originally are there. So it may be that a blockchain micro-credential or blockchain badges is the way to solve that particular part of the problem it probably would have slowed adoption in lots of other ways. And so had we started it today with blockchain, we might actually not be here 10 years later because it also makes things opaque potentially and you know, all kinds of other problems. And so the discoverability and the ability to kind of combine things might be more difficult with the blockchain. Hi, my name is Geoffroy Garon from Montreal, flipping Malian. Uh, my question is about, uh, the, with, with Mozilla, do you think to use Badge's mindset to, uh, to figure out about your new project, about voice, the project, about AI, ethics, or the, uh, or the open hardware we're facing IoT everywhere, so maybe we can, Badge's is not just for credentialing, uh, learning, it's also to, to make tra traceability on things, on objects, or recognition of tools, so what is your mindset about the, the voice or ethical uh, AI aspect? You need my job. <laughs> um, and clearly reading too much about Mozilla, I can tell from your stickers. Um, and uh, so that's a, wow, that's a big set of topics. And, and, and I think, no, it's, it's a good set of things. So I guess the, I, I take it, I, I kind of take two things from the question. One is uh, probably the, I think the one you're talking about, which is, you know, is there a way to kind of use open badges or the badge kind of way of um, credentialing and tracking and moving things around, say, for certifying that something would be an ethical piece of uh, machine learning technology or an ethical piece of uh, IoT so that, it, you know, if I could pick this up, I can know, you know, you assessed it and it was ethical and uh, is that sort of what you're talking about? 
And, and it's a good, it's an interesting thing that I haven't thought about because we actually do have other people working on, say, like a, a trust mark for uh, IoT devices. And I haven't really thought about whether the badge technology fits into that. So it's a, it's a good question to, and it's worth, it's a thread worth pulling. Um, I, the, the thing you probably didn't mean um, that is, uh, is that something that I've kind of got in mind is how do we actually do innovation in some of these places where um, technology is potentially going in a negative direction or an ossifying direction um, and use philanthropic and open source kind of combo techniques to do it. And one of the things that you're talking about probably people here don't know about is we have a, a set of uh, open source voice technologies, including a project called Common Voice, which is about people contributing to a, a voice training data set, both lets there be an open source, basically open source Alexa data, but also, uh, you know, so anybody could innovate with it, but also makes it possible to, in that data, do small languages that are never going to get picked up by Amazon or Google or, or whatever. And I think that kind of approach where, which we're actually working with in the German government in Rwanda, strangely, is, um, Kirwanda, which is the local language there, is not in any voice recognition system. The idea that they can invest public money into a, a pool like that and that it helps build something overall is, you know, trying to do that same kind of film philanthropy, public money, open source investment strategy. We'll see if that goes somewhere. But that's where the open badges stuff, to me, taught us hopefully something that we can do in the future and do it in a way that's not about trying to control it, which I, I think probably we try to do too much in the middle period of badges. So I don't know, that's that not quite what you're asking, but. So maybe we can take one more question and then we have to get on with the day at the back there. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name's Tracy Dallaire, I'm from Mohawk College. Uh, thank you for your talk today. Um, my question, or, or I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, the employers that are out there that are going to be hiring um, students coming out of higher education that have micro-credentials as well as employers who have existing employees that want to get micro-credentials, what's your sense of the industry's recognition or understanding of the importance of micro-credentials and what maybe we can be doing as a community to help them understand the value of those so that they're uh, looking at that as a value add for employing people as well as channeling professional development dollars towards um, their existing employees continuing their education. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot in that. And I guess that on the first part of it, which is, you know, how do I think employers are seeing it? I, I feel pretty out of date and that there's people in the room here who probably have a better sense of that. Certainly that was the thing we were trying to make happen uh, from, you know, from the 2015 era. Um, and it was hard. Um, and it goes to your second question, like what could you all do and, and you know, maybe what are you doing? Is it, it is a chicken or egg problem of, you know, I, is there something out there that I'm seeing in micro-credentials that helps me solve a business problem, which is getting the right talent, get, getting me to hard to find talent, uh, getting me talent that's going to have better retention, getting to talent that cheaper, like whatever that is. And so I think that the answer to what to do uh, and, you know, you can't do that until there's actually a set of people who've got, you know, micro-credentials that solve those problems. That's, I think the, the key thing, and it is where, you know, the conversation we were having a little bit before about the different competencies and skills that Ontario employers are looking for versus, say, in Arkansas or, you know, Italy or whatever, knowing what employers are hungry for and then, you know, and that are going to be durably hungry for, so like looking at where the workforce gaps are going to be or where they're having hard times hiring over, say, like the next five, ten year time frame, and then targeting, like, simply their top two or three needs, um, you know, may not be the most sexy, you know, disrupt and democratize education stuff, but it is probably the stuff that will unlock what, what you're looking for. And so probably pretty simple, like, market analysis of, like, what do employers need, and then this group, you know, focusing on that. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Mark.